Welcome to the fifth meeting in 2015 of the Finance Committee of the Scottish Parliament, which I'm pleased to say is being translated for use of British Sign Language. I welcome our BSL interpreters, uh, Shauna Dixon, Paul Belmonte. And before we start our formal proceedings, I would like to remind everyone to help our BSL interpreters by speaking clearly and not too quickly, which some things should really apply to me as well, I suppose, and keeping questions short and concise and allowing a short pause after the last speaker has finished. Uh, could I please remind everyone present to turn off any mobile phones, tablets or other electronic devices? We have received apologies this morning from Gavin Brown, who is unwell. Our first item of business this morning is to decide whether to take item 9 in private. Are members agreed? Yes. Members have indicated their agreement. Our next item of business is to take evidence from the Cabinet Secretary for Finance, Constitution and Economy on the Land and Buildings Transaction Tax, Addition and Modification of Reliefs, Scotland Order 2014. The Cabinet Secretary is joined for this item by David Curucci, Neil Ferguson and John St Clair of the Scottish Government. I'd like to invite the Cabinet Secretary to make an opening statement explaining the instrument I remind him not to move the motion at this point. Thank you, Kavira. The UK stamp duty land tax legislation includes a number of miscellaneous reliefs which apply only in relation to specific organisations or types of property. The purpose of this order is to include in our LBTT legislation five similar miscellaneous reliefs using the power in section 27.3a of the Land and Buildings Transactions Act Scotland Act 2013. The five reliefs are, um, firstly, Friendly Societies Relief, which provides relief from LBTT where two or more registered friendly societies amalgamate. Secondly, Building Societies Relief, which provides relief where two or more building societies amalgamate. Thirdly, Visiting Forces and International Military Headquarters Relief, which provides relief for land transactions involving the building or enlarging of barracks or camps for a visiting force facilitating the training of a visiting force or promoting the health or efficiency of a visiting force. Fourthly, uh, relief for property accepted in satisfaction of tax. Under section 11A of the National Heritage Act 1980, which extends to England, Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland, a land transaction entered into by any museum, art gallery, library or other similar institution is relieved from stamp duty land tax where property is offered to HMRC by a taxpayer in respect of tax. The property may be transferred to one of a range of heritage bodies. Some government-sponsored cultural and heritage bodies in Scotland do have powers to acquire land or buildings. This includes acquiring as acceptances in respect and usually requires the specific agreement of ministers. If LBTT was to be incurred by cultural and heritage bodies in such cases, any acceptance of land or buildings in lieu would, re would result in a liability on the part of the accepting body to pay LBTT on the acquisition. This would, in fact, be a charge on the public purse. This relief from LBTT, which is an equivalent position, provision to that which is currently in place for SDLT, has therefore been added to avoid that outcome. Uh, fifthly, uh, lighthouse, Lighthouses Relief. Under section 221 of the Merchant Shipping Act 1995, which extends to England, Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland, a land transaction is relieved from SDLT if it is entered into by or under the direction of the General Lighthouse Authorities, including the Commissioners of Northern Lighthouses who oversee the lighthouse infrastructure in Scotland, for the purpose of carrying on services funded through the General Lighthouse Fund. The Northern Lighthouse Board has confirmed that given the widely distributed network of lighthouses and the need for regular changes to reflect changes in shipping traffic to ensure the continued safety of navigation, it, is a, it has a regular number of land transactions and that will carry on into the future. On rare occasions, the Board may be directed by the Secretary of State to undertake activity that may require such transactions. This relief has therefore been included in LBTD to deal with such circumstances. Um, finally, convener, the order also makes two amendments to existing reliefs within the LBTT Act. In support of crofting in Scotland, it provides for full relief from LBTT for transactions involving the crofting community right to buy, under which two or more crofts are bought, rather than the partial effect that is available under SDLT. 
The Order also makes a minor but crucial amendment to the relief for certain acquisitions by registered social landlords to ensure that if any one of the conditions is satisfied, the relief is available. Thank you very much for that opening statement, Cabinet Secretary. I have no questions. I'll just see if any colleagues around the table have any questions. Malcolm. Just about the community corrupting right to buy. It's really just for clarification. So are you saying that you only get partial relief for one property, but you get full relief for more than one property? And I'm just wondering, and, you, and, and is that different from a stamp duty land tax? I, I just wondered, I'm just trying to clarify the position. And if that is the case, why, why have you decided to give full relief for multiple purchases? It, well, it is full relief. And the justification for this is essentially to remove um, a, a particular obstacle that may influence the, um, a, a particular judgment being arrived at as to whether or not to exercise the right to buy or not and to assist that process. Um, Jean? I just wanted clarification on the visiting forces and international military headquarters relief. Um, does that mean that they... Well, can you, can you give uh, an example of circumstances where an the, EU army might buy land? The, the only circumstance may be if there was to be... Um, the only circumstance I can consider is uh, where there may be um, a military exercise underway that may be planned and taken forward over a sustained period of time um, that such, um, uh, uh, such a, uh, a, a, a circumstance would arise. Okay, thank you. <coughs> okay, uh, there are no further uh, questions from members of the committee. So uh, we therefore move to the debate on the motion. I'd like to invite the Cabinet Secretary formally to move motion S4M12186. Uh, move formally, Convener. Uh, thank you, Cabinet Secretary. I now put the question on the motion. And the question is that motion S4M12186 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Members are all agreed. The committee will now publish a short report to the Parliament setting out a decision on the order. Our next item of business is to take evidence again from the Cabinet Secretary on this occasion on three pieces of subordinate legislation relating to the land and buildings transaction tax and one concerning the landfill tax. I'd like to invite the Cabinet Secretary to make an opening statement. Uh, thank you, Kavira. I'll explain the purpose of each of the um, three instruments, uh, which are all subject to the negative procedure in turn. Um, the uh, LBTT Administration Regulations 2014, the main purpose of this instrument is to allow taxpayers who are unable to quant quantify their land and buildings transaction tax liability when the price they are paying is either uncertain or is dependent on a contingency to apply to defer the payment of tax in the same situations as they would currently apply for deferment from UK stamp duty land tax. The regulations set out the framework for such applications and include the decision-making process that Revenue Scotland must adhere to, the grounds for refusing an application to defer a tax payment and the arrangements for making tax returns and payments. The regulations also provide, prescribe the evidence that must be provided to Revenue Scotland for the purposes of relief for alternative finance investment bonds. Um, on the Ancillary Provision Order 2014, to ensure prompt payment and deliver administrative efficiencies, the LBTT Act requires agents to make a return and pay any tax due before any application to the Registers of Scotland in respect of the land register or books of council and session can be accepted. It, section 43 of the Act creates a link between land registration and payment of LBTT by providing that documents affecting or evidencing a land transaction may not be registered unless a land transaction return has been made and any LBTT due has been paid. This rule has relevance in relation to registers managed and controlled by the Keeper, including the Books of Council and Session, which is a court register. Uh, the purpose of the ancillary provision order is to introduce a mandatory requirement to submit the appropriate application form when applying for registration in Books of Council and Session of any deed implementing a notifiable transaction. This will enable the Keeper to fulfil the duty in subsection 43.1 of the LBTT Act not to accept an application for registration of documents in the Books of Council and Session until a tax return and payment have been made. The transitional 
Provisions Order 2014 um, relates to LBTT um, uh, as um, when it becomes chargeable. Um, the commencement date will be set in a commencement order made by Scottish Ministers under subsection 72 of the LBTT Act. SDLT will be disapplied in Scotland on a date to be appointed by the Treasury uh, under subsection 29.4 of the Scotland Act 2012. This order defines the commencement date for LBTT by reference to the day after the date appointed by Treasury order uh, under these provisions. Subsection 29.5 of the Scotland Act 2012 12 makes provision for certain land transactions to which SDLT will continue to apply, <coughs> namely a land transaction for which the contract for the transaction was entered into or was substantially performed prior to royal assent of the Scotland Act 2012 on the 1st of May 2012. Section 29.6 makes provision for certain land transactions to which SDLT will no longer apply, for instance, where there has been, no assignation, where there has been an assignation or subsale in a contract entered into prior to the 1st of May 2012. The purpose of this order is to make provision for certain transactions that began under SDLT but have an effective date on or after commencement of LBTT. The intention is to ensure, firstly, that through the transitional period where SDLT is disapplied in Scotland and LBTT is introduced, such transactions are not taxed twice by both SDLT and Land and Buildings Transaction Tax, but are subject to one of the taxes and secondly, secondly, to ensure that if the outcome of the Scotland Act provisions is that no tax would be payable, it is payable <coughs> under LBTT if it would otherwise have been payable under SDLT. The order makes provision to achieve those intentions for 13 different types of land transactions or arrangements involving land transactions. Uh, thank you very much for that, Cabinet Secretary. Uh, colleagues around the table, have any questions? Malcolm. In the consultation, three respondents asked whether guidance would be issued to address a perceived lack of detail regarding the information to be provided in a deferment application. The policy note confirms that Revenue Scotland will publish such guidance in due course. Uh, how long will it be until this information is made publicly available? Uh, the 16th of February. Okay, thank you. Questions uh, from uh, the committee. I'd like to thank the witnesses um, this morning. And I'll just call a one minute uh, recess to allow the witnesses to leave. Have we not still got landfill tax to do from here? Um... Oh, yes, you're absolutely no, well, Yes, you're right. I'm afraid there's a mistake in my uh, briefing, actually, which says you're going to leave at this mo moment. And it does say that we should consider it after you have left. So my assumption was that you were actually going uh, to leave. But um, we will go through land building. We will go through the, the landfill tax first. Apologies for that. Yes. Could you speak to the landfill tax then? Apologies. Thank, th thank you, Convener. Um, the regulations use powers from both the Landfill Tax Scotland Act 2014 and the Revenue Scotland Tax Powers Act 2014 to provide a number of provisions relating to registration, accounting, credits, the Scottish Landfill Communities Fund and rules for the weighing of waste. The regulations formed a significant part of the Scottish Government's consultation paper on secondary legislation for Scottish landfill tax published in May 2014. We also receive feedback on the proposals from a number of consultation events held over the course of the year. Landfill operators will be able to register with Revenue Scotland from the 16th of February 2015. They must do so within 30 days of their intention to carry out landfill activities. The regulations also make provision to allow the landfill operator to correct any inaccuracy or make changes to their details. Um, a landfill operator's first accounting period begins on the day they become registered. Tax returns should be submitted along with any payment of tax no, long, no later than 44 days after the end of each accounting period. In recognition of points raised in the consultation process, we increase this from 30 days in recognition that aligning tax accounting periods with environmental reporting periods return could result in transitional cash flow issues for some operators. Um, the regulations provide for a tax credit system insofar as a person who is paid or is liable to pay tax may be entitled to credit uh, providing prescribed conditions are fulfilled. The credit provisions cover three areas, bad debts, removing material for reuse and recycling, and the Scottish Landfill Communities Fund. Um, 
I will focus on the regulations that establish a Scottish Landfill Communities Fund, which provides funding for community or environmental projects in recognition of the disamenity experienced in the vicinity of landfill sites. I have already made Parliament aware of my intention to introduce a proposed enhancement to the tax credit arrangements under which the Scottish Landfill Communities Fund will operate. As we landfill less, it is inevitable that less money will be available to the Fund in the coming years. Increases in the credit cap will not offset the expected decline in tax revenues caused by the amount of material going to landfill. I have ensured the regulatory approach is appropriate, while capping administration costs at a maximum of 10 per cent to ensure that as large a proportion of contributions as possible goes to project expenditure. The 10 mile radius rule that is applied to the UK fund is a matter of much debate. I believe that communities most affected by landfill should benefit most from the fund. I also recognise that under current arrangements, those that suffer from the transportation and transfer of waste going to landfill are ineligible unless they live near a landfill site. The regulations also provide that projects near a transfer station will be eligible to apply to the fund. Uh, the objectives of the fund are set out in the regulations. Um, during the consultation, a significant number of stakeholders observed that including waste prevention was a logical addition to the community reuse and recycling objective. There was also support for including sites of archaeological interest to the objective, allowing funds to be spent on historical buildings, provided that the sites are accessible to the public and within the vicinity of the landfill site. These proposals have been incorporated in the list of objectives for the Scottish Landfill Communities Fund. A contribution and any income derived must be spent on an approved objective of the fund within the two years of the original contribution being made. Work is continuing with stakeholders, SEPA and with, other, with the other regulator of the UK fund, Entrust, to ensure processes are in place to establish the Landfill Communities Fund. Um, finally, convener, um, as part of the consultation, we propose changing the way waste is weighed for determining tax when entering a landfill site. Under the existing system, a landfill operator can apply to discount the water content of waste in certain circumstances, for example, where water has been used to damp down waste to reduce dust. The proposal in our consultation was to exclude water discount provisions in the Scottish landfill tax. The main reason for this was that the arrangements can be quite complex and can allow for tax evasion whilst liquid wastes are banned from landfill. Stakeholders identified concerns around health and safety, waste tourism and that it would put Scottish business at a competitive disadvantage. In the light of these arguments, I have introduced provisions discounting tax due on non-naturally occurring water from waste deposits along the lines of the UK discount. Okay, thank you very much for that. Colleagues, any questions? Mark? Uh, just one, Commissioner. You mentioned the um, discussions ongoing regarding the establishment of the, the Landfill Communities Fund, which obviously at present is administered on a UK-wide basis by Entrust. Have you any indication as to when you expect that to take effect? Obviously, a number of organisations derive funding through Landfill Communities Fund and obviously are waiting to see the successor arrangements that the Scottish Government envisages. Yeah, I, I would want that to be in place for the 1st of April. OK. In place. Uh, OK, well, thank you very much for that, Cabinet Secretary. We'll just have a one-minute break while uh, our witnesses leave, and then we'll go on to... Uh, consider the night those negative instruments. Thanks.
I shall uh, restart the, the session. Um, our next item of business is to consider the negative instruments on which we have just heard evidence. I'd like to ask uh, members if they have any comments they wish to report on the instruments. Members have no comments uh, to make. Okay. Uh, moving swiftly on, the next item on our agenda is consideration of the Community Charge Debt Scotland Bill at Stage 2. For this item, we are joined by uh, Marco Biaggi, the Minister for Local Government and Community Empowerment, who is accompanied by Lauren Glenn, Katrina Graham, uh, Laura Barry and Colin Brown of the Scottish Government. Uh, I'd like to welcome you to uh, committee. I know it's your first time at the Finance Committee. Hopefully it won't be uh, your last. And I'd like to... <laughs> I invite the Minister to make uh, an opening statement, if he so wishes. Thank you, and thank you for that slight air of threat to your welcome there. This isn't just my first time in front of the Finance Committee, this is my first time in front of any committee in my capacity as Minister, uh, setting aside the Scottish Youth Parliament that once grilled me very, very effectively on education policy. I hope that this experience will be uh, perhaps a, a little bit smoother. Uh, I would like to welcome the Finance Committee report that was published. Uh, it was very helpful. The committee raised a number of points, and the Cabinet Secretary and Deputy First Minister has already uh, responded to these points by uh, letter. Uh, this session is focusing more on the content of the bill itself. So, for an opening statement, I'd just like to reiterate the, the Government's thinking as to why the bill is drafted as it is. Our overriding concern was that local authorities might use the information gathered from voter registration to pursue outstanding poll tax debt. And we wanted to make crystal clear as well that local authorities were absolved of any obligations they felt they had to collect poll tax debt. And we wanted to make sure that the legislation itself was simple, straightforward and unambiguous. We decided, therefore, to take the approach of extinguishing the liability for the debt. Had the legislation been phrased differently, for example, making it illegal for local authorities to collect poll tax debt, this might have caused difficulties for the local authorities had uh, payment arrangements not been cancelled by the debtor. We also wanted to ensure that local authorities had sufficient warning of the extinguishing of the liabilities so that the existing payment arrangements could be closed down. As section 2, the interpretation section shows the associated liabilities, which are also extinguished by the bill, are many and various. They include interest charges and fines, all of which were imposed as part of the process for collecting poll tax. And if Parliament passes the, this bill, all of these liabilities will be extinguished with effect from Sunday past. This not only lifts a burden from the debtor, but also from local authorities, letting them concentrate, uh, as some of them have told this committee, on breaking the cycle of debt. Getting rid of this historic debt will help to do that. Thank you very much for that opening statement. Do any colleagues have any questions? Going, going, gone. Uh, no amendments have been lodged, but we are obliged to consider each section and the long title and agree formally uh, to each. Standing orders allow us to put a single question where groups of sections are to be considered consecutively, and that is what I propose to do. Firstly, the question is that sections 1 to 4 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Members are agreed. Secondly, the question is that the long title be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. That ends stage 2, consideration of the Community Charge Debt Scotland Bill. The Parliament has agreed that stage 3 proceedings will take place on Thursday 19th of February. Because of the recess week, that means that the deadline for lodging stage 3 amendments is 4.30pm on Friday 6th of February. Amendments can be lodged with the clerks and the legislation team. I'd like to thank the Minister and uh, I'll just uh, have a five minute break to allow him and his um, officials to leave and to give members a natural break and allow the next witnesses to come into the committee. So thank you very much.
Okay, I will now reconvene the session. Uh, our next item of business is to take evidence on the British Sign Language Scotland Bill's financial <laughs> memorandum uh, from Mark Griffin, MSP, and Joanna Hardy of the Parliament's <laughs> Non-Governmental uh, Bills Unit. I'd like to welcome our witnesses to the meeting and invite Mr Griffin to make an opening statement. Thank you, Convener. Good to be at the Finance Committee uh, this morning. Um, the bill, as it stands, would um, introduce the responsibility on the government um, to produce a national plan on British Sign Language and to promote the use of British Sign Language um, in public life in Scotland. I think there's been um, a gap in, in provision in Scotland where um, people who use BSL, um, it's their main language, um, they don't have the opportunity to learn any other language um, and that this bill should um, start making improvements in, in the recognition of that language and the culture of the language and access to services. Um, I'm happy to take any questions on the financial memorandum that you have in front of you. Uh, thank you very, very much for that. Now, uh, I know you haven't been to the Finance Committee before, so that the, uh, generally what will happen is I'll ask you some opening questions, and then I'll just pass, uh, um, uh, I'll open the session up, I should say, to colleagues around the table, and um, we'll take it from there, really. So, first uh, question I would ask, basically, is just really about the overall cost estimates. Um, paragraph 11 of the Financial Memorandum uh, points out that the cost estimates provided involve such large margins of uncertainty um, and the, the, what we've got is cost <coughs> variances of several million pounds on a, and also on a kind of annualised uh, basis. Uh, your view uh, is, I take it, that uh, this should be funded fully by the Scottish Government? Yep, I mean, at, at first glance, obviously, a, a £6 million pounds estimate at the top the top of the range does seem like a, a large amount of money, but I think it has to be, um, it should be noted that that's across 117 um, public bodies. And that uh, figure is spread over five years. And with the government's suggested amendments, that, that actually would probably be spread over a period of um, seven years um, and spread right across those public bodies. I think. Um, the Scottish Government have already committed to £2 million of funding, um, so that leaves a um, gap of, of £4 million that would need to be, to be made up. Some public bodies, in response to your um, call for evidence, have said that they would be able to absorb the costs um, of the bill within um, their own budget, but ultimately um, it will be a decision for government and ministers as to whether they choose to provide... Um, any additional funding over the £2 million that they've already committed to? Now, uh, the issue, of course, would be that if the Scottish Government was not able or, in, or indeed willing to fully fund, uh, as you have suggested, I mean, East Lothian Council says, and I quote, there is a risk of plans having no substance because local authorities are not in a position to allocate new monies to new activity and do not themselves say that BSL should be championed over other inclusive means of communication. I mean, how would you respond to those concerns? Um, I, mean, I think that gets to the, the heart of the reason for the, the bill. Um, there's postcode provision of services um, across Scotland, and the bill would aim to have the government set out their priorities for BSL through a national plan and for public authorities to draft their own plans and then report to Parliament on the on the progress which would allow um, BSL users and all of our constituencies to actually scrutinise what public bodies are, are doing. And like, like I said at the start, <coughs> British Sign Language is for many people the only language that they will ever know. Um, it's not like another minority language where um, people have the opportunity um, to learn English or, or Gaelic or any other language. It's for most it's the only language they'll ever know and ever um, learn. And I think there's a responsibility on public bodies to recognise that and provide the, the level of service that you or I would expect um, in English. 
Okay, uh, thank you. I mean, uh, Mid Lothian Council says that uh, the FM, and I quote, assumes a planning process very specifically for BSL rather than incorporating BSL issues into other strategic planning streams associated with inclusion, disability, and equality, in particular work associated with the implementation of C here. Um, and there are a number of other organisations that have similar kind of concerns. So, I, I understand what you're, you're saying about BSL being obviously unique relative to, for example, spoken languages, but what about their um, concerns that Midlothian have uh, that this, uh, uh, by implication, detracts from some of the things that they're doing already, for example, as they've already said, in terms of the see here implementation? Yeah, I mean, that's a view they're obviously able to take. I, I take a different view in that I don't see British Sign Language as a a disability issue. Um, British Sign Language is, is a language. Um, it's a culture in its own right. And for me, I don't think that um, when people consider it their language and their culture, that we should ask people to define themselves as disabled. Um, to be honest, I think you'd have a big fight on your hands if you were to try and um, tell a lot of the people who I've met over the course of this and uh, developing this bill who use BSL that they are disabled um, just because you use a different language from most of us around the table um, doesn't um, take away from your ability to do anything that we can. So I, I do have an issue with um, British Sign Language being classed as, um, as a dis disability or equalities issue. This, is, this bill is... is I've been clear from the start that this is about a language um, and the language and culture of, of British Sign Language. Um, it is unique in, in that you can't learn another language. Um, so it's, there are some differences, obviously, with Gaelic, Scots or, or English. Um, but, like I said, this is about the culture and um, language aspects rather than any disability aspect. But surely it must have some equalities um, uh, considerations because, I mean, what you're effectively looking for is people um, who use BSL to have the same equal access as, as other people in Scotland? Yeah, I'm looking for BSL, BSL users to have the same access as, as you or I. If we, if we were contacting our local authority um, about the education service um, they were providing, if a, a BSL parent was wanting to inquire about um, a service for their child, I would expect them to get that um, same level of access. The, the, the quality of access, um, I think, issue pops up just because of the unique nature of the language um, and that you can't learn um, any other language. So you are straying into issues of equality, but I've been trying to keep the focus of this purely on a language um, and cultural issue with the added complication that there is most of the time no opportunity to learn any other language. OK. Uh, just one further area before I open up to colleagues around the table, and that's uh, um, the, the Scottish Association of Sign Language Interpreters. Um, they have um, suggested that no costs are provided for ancillary uh, organisations that may be requested to provide information, expertise and advice to meet the objectives. And I understand there's only about 18 interpreters in Scotland, and uh, uh, th there are... So, so one could suggest there's a real shortage of people. Um, how confident are you that, um, assuming that the cost issues are addressed in terms of the Scottish Government and local authorities, that other organisations, there will be no unintended consequences which will impact upon them, uh, and that there will actually be the, the resource in terms of people to actually deliver this? Um. Yeah, I, I mean, the lack of interpreters is is one of the big motivations behind the bill and it's a sort of chicken and egg situation where if you never address the situation then you're never going to increase the number of interpreters available so if we do nothing we could carry on with 80 interpreters or a fallen number of interpreters um, forever um, basically uh, I mean, we consulted on the legislation and and Sasley had come back in previous consultations and said that they didn't expect there to be any financial implications um, as a result of the bill. So um, I'm going to go away and speak to Sasley about um, their submission um, today just because there's a slight conflict. But I mean, I think 
um, while they might be expected to contribute to local authorities or, or public bodies' consultation, and that uh, could well have a, a resource implication for them. At the same time, um, there will also be an increased demand for interpreter services um, and the ability for um, organisations that provide interpreter services or um, represent BSL users, there will be um, an opportunity for them to um, contract for um, interpreting work and translation work. So there may well be an increase in income to these um, sorts of bodies as well. Um, the government have also suggested streamlining some of the work um, around public bodies' plans and whether that can be streamlined to be a more uh, locality-based consultation um, or a, a simpler BSL statement, which um, I've said I'm happy to, to accept those government amendments to streamline some of those costs, which should re reduce um, some of those burdens if, if there are going to be any on those other um, organisations. OK, uh, thank you for that. Uh, I'm going to now going to open up the session. The first colleague to ask questions will be uh, Deputy Convener John, to be followed by Mark. Uh, thank you, uh, Convener. Um, you know, I have to confess this is not an area I'm hugely familiar with, so some of my questions may be on the kind of simple side of things. Just following on from what the Convener said, if there's a shortage of uh, interpreter services or people able to interpret, would that have an impact financially? Because either... I mean, if there weren't enough, people wouldn't be able to spend the money, even if the money was there. Or, is, I mean, is there any, there any kind of danger of inflation that costs kind of go up if everybody's looking for these services? Um, it could be the case that costs for interpreters go up if they realise there's, there's a market for that sort of demand. But the government have already started work um, on a, a national online uh, translation process. They have that in place for... NHS 24, where you, if you're a BSL user, you, you can um, dial into the online translation service. Um, and there are things in development that will um, reduce some of the, the translation costs if you're reducing travelling time um, and things. But it goes back to uh, my answer to the convener, though. If, if you don't do anything about it, you're in a chicken and egg situation. And in Finland where they have a similar population to us. They have 750 interpreters. Um, in Scotland, we have 80. And that's why there is such a, a big demand on those services. And I hope that um, if the bill were to pass, that that promotion um, of BSL in public life would increase the number of interpreters who are coming through the system, um, because they're already overstretched. OK, so, so there's 80 interpreters, and they're serving a population of how many people would only use BSL as a language? Um, it, it's, it's difficult to say exactly. There's no exact figure. The last census estimated around 13,000 um, BSL users. Um, but a lot of the, the BSL organisations would question that figure simply because uh, the census is an exercise carried out in English. And... Um, for, for some BSL users, um, English isn't their language and um, can't respond to the census figures. Other um, figures put um, any level of hearing loss in Scotland at around uh, 1 million, um, but that ranges right across um, from mild, severe to, to profound. Um, but with a similar population in Finland, like I said, 750 interpreters. I would say 13,000 or a bit more than that. I mean, is that all people who have only BSL as a language, or do some of them have another language like they could read English? Um, that's, there's not, there isn't that level of um, sophistication or detail in the, the figures for the census for me to be able to answer that accurately. I, mm -hmm. I could come back to the um, committee with that level of detail. If it's there, um, I can go back to those organisations. OK, thank you. Now, one of the points that was made was that uh, the bill does not require the, these plans that are to be drawn up to be translated into BSL. Is that something you're looking at or taking on board? Um, that was something that was there purely to um, keep the costs of the, the bill down. Um, the, the government in their memorandum have suggested an amendment, and I'm 
delighted to see it there that they feel that the plan should be translated into BSL and that they would support that. So I'm delighted to accept that amendment. And have we got a cost for that bit? Uh, the, go the government have suggested, I think, between a range of two to three and a half thousand pounds um, per authority. Mm -hmm. um, I think that's right, Joanna. Mm -hmm. Sorry, a range of um, £1,250 to £3,150 um, per authority to translate <coughs> their, their plans into BSL. Um, but the government, have, on that headline, £6 million, and um, the government have taken that into account. Right. So it's not huge money. That's fair enough. And I mean, the other suggestion I think you referred to the government had made was that things could be done locally. Does that mean like several local authorities working together kind of thing? Yep. The government have, have spoken about the... Um, Dr. Allen, when I met with him, used the, the example of um, Orkney and um, having Orkney Council, Orkney Health Board um, and other authorities responding, um, each responding separately to different consultations and whether there was a possibility to streamline that into a locality, whether, whether that could be a, a, a Strathclyde region idea or whether it would be a health board area region where... Um, public bodies could come together and respond collectively to, to reduce the, the burden. Um, but, and I was open to, to any amendments on that basis. That's great. OK, thank you. Uh, I mean, another question that came up was this question of the cycle about how often or how quickly people need to get the plans and then report on the plans. And I think your legislation is linked to the parliamentary uh, session, whereas there had been, a, I think the government was suggesting seven years, which again I assume would reduce the cost slightly, but maybe if it, is that too long? Um, the, the reason that I had linked it to the parliamentary cycle, it wasn't, it wasn't for any um, consideration of language planning, it was, it was purely um, related to the political process where um, I felt it would be beneficial for the government of the day to introduce their national plan at the start of a parliamentary session and then report on the progress at the end of the parliamentary session, um, rather than having an, an incoming government um, report on the performance of a, a previous government's policy priorities. Um, so it, my suggestion was purely on that basis. Um, on speaking to the government and their experience with the Gaelic Language Act, um, they've suggested that um, the four or five year timetable is uh, perhaps a bit tight and a bit, a bit short, and that just because of their experience with uh, Gaelic language, that, um, they think it's more practical to extend to seven years. Um, so obviously there's a balance between um, scrutinising a government on their own performance, but if uh, the government advisers have had those issues with the Gaelic Language Act, then again, as with other suggested amendments from the government, I've been happy to um, accept that. Um, I think you'd suggested too that um, when subsequent plans were produced, they would be they would cost less, and I think the suggestion was 30% less, presumably because you're kind of revising something that's there already, which does make some sense. Although the, the kind of counter argument is, well, expectations are going to rise; they're going to become more complex. Therefore, there wouldn't be a saving. How, how do you respond to that? It, it was a. It was an anticipation that the, the first plan to be produced would require the, the largest amount of work and that, for the most part, um, any subsequent plan, plans would be building on that initial plan and also incorporating um, whatever um, came out of the performance review. Um, so an expectation that a large amount of the work, which would feed into the, the second, third, fourth plan, would have been done in the performance review, um, and that was the basis for the reduction um, in costs. Okay, thanks very much. Thank you, Mark. Before followed by Jean. So, thank you, convener. I think most of the ground has been covered, but perhaps I can just query a, a couple of things. Um, the the expectation behind well, the, the legislation is that, that that there would be the production of the plan, um, and, and that's what all the costing is based on. Is based around production of the plan. Is that correct? Um, 
Colleges Scotland, um, in their submission, have said um, that the committee will want to note that whilst the requirement is to produce a plan only, the publication of such a plan will almost certainly increase public expectation that would require additional funds in future years. Um, and that obviously uh, is talking about implementation, because obviously if you're going to produce a plan, uh, the, the expectation out there would be that that plan would then be implemented. Can I ask why you didn't factor in implementation uh, of the plan in terms of either your, your legislation or your costings? I mean, I, I see this, um, this bill as enabling and providing a platform for the government to set out their um, policy priorities. I mean, I could, I could tell you what I think the policy priorities for the, the BSL community would be in terms of um, support for um, a curriculum in BSL in secondary schools, um, the, a minimum requirement for uh, BSL teachers of a specific level of qualification. There are a whole range of um, policy priorities that um, I think would improve uh, BSL users' lives. Um, but this bill is um, given government um, that, pl that platform to set out their um, policy priorities. So it'll be, up for, it'll be up to the government of the day to decide which area they choose to, to focus on. So it's difficult for me to then, um, with that in mind, to, to choose a particular area that would tie the, the government's hands um, I think if we were talking about that kind of focused legislation, if it was focusing on um, education or provision of, of classes, then um, the price tag associated with that would mean it would really need to be um, a government bill rather than a, a private member's bill, to be honest. So your expectation would be the plan, the, the, the cost of this about the production of the plan, and then it is for the assorted public bodies to in the production of that plan, determine what bits, what the costs, etc., would be of implementation and, and produce their plan accordingly? Yep. Okay. Thanks. Jean? Uh, thank you, convener. Good morning, Mark. Um, I guess my, my question is uh, perhaps not a, around the financial memorandum, which it should be, but uh, just an observation, really. I, given the Scottish Government's ambition for one plus two, uh, language plan in primary schools and the, uh, there, there are uh, experiments in that happening just now uh, or, uh, in primary school but I was in a primary school recently and they've selected uh, BSL as the, the, the first language that's for primary one uh, to do B BSL which means they would do that through and start their second language in primary five. Is that something that y you're aware of in the landscape in Scotland just now, and that that, that might be something that's already, that the government will already be uh, looking at uh, financial implications of introducing uh, one plus two? Yeah. I mean, that's something that, I mean, there are, there are pockets of, of good work um, going on. Um, Art galleries and museums in Glasgow have translated massive amounts of information um, into to BSL. Um, one of the, the prisons, I think it's HMP Grampian, um, have tra started training all their prison staff in, in BSL. Um, you've got excellent education facilities like Dingwall Academy, um, which is a, a centre for um, BSL. So there are, there are pockets of excellent practice um, going on right across the country, I'd say, on the issue of education and, and Dingwall Academy have made representations on this, is that um, pupils are given the opportunity to learn um, BSL as a subject in first and second year, and then when uh, they go on to um, their new national exams, that there is no curriculum and no qualification available to secondary pupils and BSL, so because of the pressure for qualifications to get a job and to college or university, that most pupils end up um, dropping um, BSL, which is an issue for training that uh, next generation of interpreters um, and teachers of BSL users to come through. So, I mean, there are 
pockets of really, really excellent um, work there, and that's something that I hope the the authority plans um, would would flag up and give um, BSL the BSL community and their own individual constituencies to then start saying, well, if that has been provided in um, Dingwall, why can't I get access to that service um, in my own area in, in North Lanarkshire? Thank you. How, how long does it take to learn BSL? Well, I mean, there are different um, levels of qualification, level one, two, three, and going right up. I mean, there are classes available at Harriet Watts that I'm sure you can look into, but I don't know exactly how long it takes to reach a particular uh, level. Thank you. Hey, Malcolm. The costs are, I think, mainly, if not exclusively, about developing and publishing the plan. I mean, is the assumption there that there'll be one member of staff who'll be doing that for a year, or how, how, how did those figures are, get arrived at in terms of how much it would cost? I think it was a, it was a middle management staff um, working um, over a, a, period of, a period of months. Joanna, are you able to comment on...? Yes, we, we, we um, based the estimate on a, a member of middle management staff working full-time for six months over the period of the plan. So some of that work would come in at the production of the plan and, and more work would come in at the end when they're feeding into the performance review. And sorry, I, I haven't looked at the precise wording of your bill. I mean, are, are there requirements in terms of what's in the plan or is it left fairly general in terms of what the plan would include? The national plan would give the, the direction to public bodies uh, and local authorities as to the expectation of um, what should be in um, their plan. So the direction would come from national mm -hmm. government. And then, finally, just I mean, Mark McDonald has touched on this, the costs of implementation. So you're saying it's not pertinent to the memorandum. Is that, I mean, are you saying that the plan will lead to extra costs, but it's just not pertinent to this bill? Or, or what exactly is behind your statement that it's not pertinent to the memorandum? Well, the bill is, is purely focused on... Um, the, the, the memorandum is purely focused on the requirement of the bill, the, the requirement in the bill is that um, government should produce a national plan, public bodies should produce their own plan, and then at the end of, a, at the, end of the cycle report on the progress they've made on implementing um, their plan. So there is no policy direction or particular initiative that is set out in the bill that um, we would be able to put a, a price tag against. It will be up to... Um, national government and public bodies as to their own priorities for their own individual unique um, constituencies as to what they, they chose to put in their national plan with a mind to how they themselves um, would fund it. I mean, I'm totally supportive of the bill, but it, but it is quite an interesting position from a point of view of the Finance Committee and the Financial Memorandum, because presumably your expectation is that following <coughs> all these plans, there will be more expenditure because otherwise the plans presumably would just be paper plans that didn't change anything. So would that be a fair assumption? That yes, yeah, certainly. I mean, um, public bodies who who drafted a, a paper plan and then made no um, made no effort to um, to implement them, the the government would report on the performance review to Parliament. Um, so constituents would be given their opportunity through their MSP to um, effectively name and shame public bodies who weren't living up to the, their own aspirations through their um, local plans. Um, there is, like I said, there is pockets of excellent work already um, ongoing and there's no reason why that should be restricted to those um, individual areas and that by getting in a a national picture of, of what's going on that will give um, BSL users the, the ability to challenge their local authorities on why they're not getting the, the service being provided elsewhere. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you, and welcome. Um, I mean, that's concluded questions of the committee, but I've just got one or two more to ask myself just before we wind up the, the session. And basically, it's on the submission from your own local authority in North Lanarkshire. I mean, as you've pointed out, you said the bill does not describe any minimum level of activity beyond the production of a local authority plan. But what 
North Lanarkshire, saying is that there will be potential additional costs for implementation, as has just been uh, touched on, and they say that uh, this has not been recognised in FM, again, as we've touched on. But what, what, what North Lanarkshire then go on to say is that in relation to education, the training costs for training of teaching staff and teaching resources has not been calculated um, as the impact of the bill has not been fully explored within an educational context. Um, I mean, are you not concerned, though, that um, because we haven't gone beyond, uh, you know, the, the kind of uh, the, the, the development of, of, of plans itself, that this could be a, a, a circumstance whereby hard-pressed local authorities are saying, look, the best will in the world, you know, we can produce... A, a, wonderful plan, but we really simply cannot um, implement the, you know, uh, what we want to do in terms of rolling this out beyond the plan and making it really mean something for people. Yeah, I mean, that will be the responsibility of local authorities. I, I, I can't see a local authority, as you say, producing a, a wonderful plan with a whole range of outcomes if they know that financially they have no intention um, of backing or supporting any of those outcomes, I think that would be that would be bad faith in the extreme and the, the part of the local authorities. Um, and when it came to reporting on performance, that if an if an authority had um, a fantastic national plan and it had done nothing to to implement it, then that would be something that the the new minister for BSL would be rightly raising with that authority and. Um, informing Parliament of. Uh, you understand uh, what you're saying in the, you know, about naming and shaming, etc. But um, North Lanarkshire, I, I think, take the view that um, you know, you know, if the resources aren't there, the resources aren't there. Even with the best world of the world, what they've said is that figures cannot be put in any additional costs arising in this way because it's not possible to estimate how much additional activity we generated from the local plans. They say that these they're unable to quantify them as unknown. Um, and they've said that to provide 24-hour covers, for example, uh, seven days a week for interpreter service would cost the council over a quarter of a million pounds a year alone. So I think, you know, there's a situation whereby, you know, a concern could be that um, expectations for this bill will be high, but the local authority's ability to deliver on the ground might be um, much less so than we would, we would like. I can understand local authorities' concern and that they are not able to put a figure on um, the activities that they might be expected to carry out, but that's because um, there is no, as yet, there is no national plan. Um, there's no level of detail of uh, what will be in that national plan and what authorities would be expected to have in their um, own plan. That would be at the direction of the government. If the government had chosen, for example, that 24-hour um, provision of interpreter services for access to a local authority's service. If they um, set that out in the national plan and expected all public authorities, um, I would expect the government to set out how they themselves intended to fund that service or um, how they expected local authorities to meet, to meet that service. That will be um, up to the government of the day to fund their own policy priorities. OK, well, thank you for that. Um, are there any further uh, points you want to raise the committee that maybe we haven't covered that you want to touch on at um, all? I, I don't think so. Just to thank the uh, committee for the time this morning. <coughs> no, I'd like to thank you uh, very much for uh, answering uh, all our questions. Uh, that being the end of this particular session, I'm just wondering if the committee would uh, uh, be, agree to consider um, um, our submission to the lead committee in private at our next meeting. Members have agreed. Uh, thanks very much, Mark. We'll now call off on a five-minute uh, recess till I change of our witnesses.
Okay, our next item of business is to take evidence on the Air Weapons and Licensing Scotland Bill's financial memorandum uh, from Scottish Government Bill Team. I'd like to welcome uh, to the meeting Quentin Fisher, Ewan Bruce, Keith Main, Walter Drummond Murray, and Peter Reid. Um, good morning to you all. Uh, members of copies of the financial memorandum, along with all written evidence received. Um, before we go to questions from uh, myself and then the rest of the committee, I'd like to invite one um, of our witnesses to make an opening statement. Who's drawn the short straw? I have. Quentin. Um, thank you, convener, for introducing us, and also thank you for inviting us today to, to, to offer evidence to the committee. Um, if I may do, take the opportunity to offer a, a couple of brief and, and also broad observations. The bill makes provision in respect of a number of new and existing licensing regimes. Any additional costs associated with the bill should be read against the wider cost to society of the activities that are regulated or indeed with the risks associated with the regulated behavior. The bill has a number of purposes. It aims to protect public safety by creating a new licensing regime for air weapons. It aims to improve aspects of locally led alcohol and civic government licensing, such as those of scrap metal dealers, taxis and private hire cars, in order to preserve public order, safety, to reduce crime, and to advance public health. It also gives local authorities the power to regulate sexual entertainment venues in the areas so that both the performers and the customers benefit from a safe and regulated environment. Now, the breadth of licensing regimes covered um, means that there's not an insignificant variation in the specific legislative detail, um, and then of, therefore, of course, also variation in the financial impact in respect of each of these. Um, this variation, I hope, is reflected accurately in the financial memorandum. Now, in keeping with current licensing practice, the bulk of the costs associated with these licensing regimes is ultimately borne by the individuals and organizations that seek to carry out the license activity. And then finally, I believe it's worth noting that many of the costs identified, particularly in respect of part three of the bill, um, that's the civic licensing um, provisions, are dependent upon future decisions that will be taken at local authority level Local authority discretion is, is quite an important principle in all of this. Um, in these instances, we have sought where possible to offer some indication of what those costs might be. Um, we'll do our best today to ensure the answers that we provide will be helpful to you in informing your, your consideration of the bill. Thank you. Okay, well, thank you very much for that brief opening statement. Um, when asked a question, you can decide among yourselves who would be the person most appropriate to answer. And if there's a, a follow up from another colleague, I'm quite happy to, uh, to, to take that uh, also. Okay, well, let's start. I'm, I'm, I suppose uh, it would be logical to go through them <laughs> uh, part one, uh, two, and then three. So let's start with uh, air weapons. Um, uh, I note that uh, those who hand in unlicensed air weapons will not be entitled to compensation. Um, uh, obviously, that will not. Uh, whether it's, uh, I mean, obviously, those the, the bill will make it illegal to possess these, but uh, w without having a, a good reason to. But surely, if you uh, don't have any compensation, that's going to, in itself, uh, suppress the number of people that are likely to hand these in. Because a lot of folk will just think, well, it's at the back of my garage, and I'm not going to go to the bother of actually digging it out you know, to take down at the local police station. So what's the thinking behind not compensating people, even a token amount, £20 or something like that, to hand in these these weapons? Can I answer that simply mm. by saying that this has been uh, an issue that's been discussed quite a lot in the course of the three or four years we've been looking at these uh, provisions and uh, working with some of the stakeholders. And I understand that it's a concern of people. There have been occasions in the past where um, changes in firearms law have led to uh, outright prohibition or banning of certain types of guns. So, for example, in, in 1997, uh, handguns were effectively prohibited. And at that stage, the, the government uh, of the day offered compensation. Um, in the Air Weapons and Licensing Bill, the, the government does not intend to, to ban air guns as such. What we're seeking to do is ensure that the, the people who have them are, are, uh, are the appropriate people, they can, they can have them safely, etc. But we're not banning guns, so it's, it, it's open to people to, um, if they no longer require their guns, our, our view is that there are an awful lot of guns, as you say, convener, in the backs of garages and things. Over, over the course of this, lots of people have said to me, we had one of those when I was a kid, it's in the loft or somewhere, I haven't seen it for years. A lot of low-value old air weapons, which have never been used, are quite 
possibly broken or you know no longer in a fit state for use. Um, it's open to people to um, hand those in to the police, and we'll be putting arrangements in place for that to sell them on through uh, private sales or through uh, registered firearms dealers, or to make other arrangements, pass them on to other users or whatever. Um, but Minister's policy has always been that because this isn't a ban, um, uh, and because uh, we're, we're talking broadly speaking about a num uh, quite a high number of what we think are low value weapons, that compensation would not be part of this, uh, these, these arrangements. No, I was just thinking more as an incentive to get them out of circulation. I mean, clearly, you know, if you have to compensate people, you get more out of circulation for people who no longer have an interest or use them than you would otherwise. But move, move on, because uh, the issue um, which, you, which Quentin touched on was that the new system will not be unduly burdensome. That, of course, is hotly contested. The AFM suggests that the cost of processing a new year weapons application be around £85.55. It's a remarkably precise figure, but one that's obviously contested by uh, some of the people who have given out submissions. For example, the British Association for Shooting and, Conversation and Conservation, uh, I'm going to try not to use acronyms where possible, um, uh, uh, said, and I quote, that the cost that will be associated with the introduction of the life scheme will be very high and huge as disruptive to already overstretched firearms licensing administrations in Scotland. Um, and you know, the Scottish Air Rifle and Pistol Association talk about the fact that 98% of people, um, according to yourselves, will be dealt with without the need to further inquiry, but they say that's incredibly misleading because half the folk who actually um, use these weapons use them for an informal target shooting in their own gardens, which of course wouldn't, isn't something we want to see because of the, the safety impact. So they, they basically um, completely refute the kind of financial um, assumptions that have been made by the bill and indeed um, are suggesting that the, you know, that the average cost will be significantly high. They talk about almost £120. I'm just wondering if you can, if you can talk us through how you come to this 98% figure and indeed, uh, you know, of uh, applications not requiring um, visits, etc. And also uh, about how you come to this £85.55 figure as well. Um, if I can take the. Uh, the 98% point first, perhaps, mm -hmm. um, is, is a figure which actually we've we arrived at in discussion with Police Scotland, who will be the licensing authority. Um, and the air weapons provisions of and the whole process of licensing, applying for and licensing uh, people to have air weapons, is based around the existing firearms regime for high-powered rifles, uh, shotguns, etc. Um, and the aim has been throughout this to provide a fairly light touch approach to air weapons, recognising that they're not generally as uh, dangerous uh, as, as more high powered guns. So a relatively high level, uh, sorry, a relatively light touch system for licensing the, the, uh, the weapons themselves. Um, and so in talking to Police Scotland, we've, we've discussed uh, a lot about how they would actually do that. Um, we accept that uh, their point, and, and it's our view, that um, there are some 60 to 65,000 existing certificate holders for other types of firearms, and many, many of them will also have air weapons and will be brought into the, the, the new regime. Much of the, the obviously, the, the security uh, issues have been looked at in, in licensing them and providing certificates for those holders. So there's a, a large number of people will be taken out of the system already. For those who are new applicants, um, it is a relatively light touch. And Police Scotland have said to us that a disclosure style uh, of arrangement where they will look at an applicant, they will check basic criminal history systems, etc., should suffice for the majority of uh, of applicants, uh, and that's, that has been the view of Police Scotland throughout. Um, they therefore believe that a 2% home visit, full home visit and, and security check is the right level. Um, obviously, as a new system comes in, that, that may vary a little bit, but, but over the piece, that's the view that we've taken, and therefore we worked up the figures on that basis. Mm -hmm. The figures themselves, um, I agree, I looked at it again in the last couple of weeks, obviously, £85.55 is, is, is very accurate. We used figures which have been um, used by uh, colleagues down south um, for the, the, the Home Office and from the Association of Chief Police Officers who have done a lot of work over the last couple of years in looking at the costs of processing existing firearms applications, etc. Uh, the, and, and a lot of the figures we have adopted uh, with their agreement for work that's been done for a working group 
in, in that context. Uh, so that takes account of processing times, the type of staff who are doing different bits of work, etc. Um, and the calculations behind the £85.55 pretty much reflect that work that's done. Um, that has led Home Office to consult recently on an increase in, in firearms fees more generally um, as, as a result of the work in that working group, and therefore we've continued to adopt that. Um, if, if I can say so, the British Association... Basque, sorry, I will just fall into those acronyms, uh, and SARPA, the Scottish, sorry, the Scottish Air Rifles and Pistols Association, um, are uh, aware of that work, and in fact, Basque were part of the working group that, that agreed those figures in, in, in the working group down south. So um, there are always differences uh, in, in uh, how we treat these, and, and I understand Basque's concerns and, and the impact on their members, but uh, we think that there's a... a a generally accepted basis for the, the, the background workings behind these figures, which we will review as, as we, we come uh, further into the year and start to look at fee levels as well. So. Well, I imagine more than, more than 2% of the population have got a criminal record, so, I mean, it seems a bit odd that it's such a, a, low, a, low, a low figure, but, I mean, the, the, I mean, it's quite burdensome, though, if it's, even it's going to be £85, you know, I mean, OK, your law-abiding citizen will grudgingly uh, apply for that, I imagine, but um, the folk who you're most worried about in terms of this legislation... You know, they're just not going to bother, are they? I mean, you know, paying 85 quid to get it licensed, you know. All you're going to do is impact adversely on your shooting clubs and all and their members, etc. you know. Um, there will be an impact on shooting clubs and members, absolutely. Mm. Um, uh, that's part and parcel of the, of the licensing system. But, but then again, um, existing firearms and shotgun owners will pay a certificate, which is currently £50 for five years. Um, mm. We haven't set a fee level yet for air weapons, but um, it, it's, the fee reflects the work that has to be done by Police Scotland in order to ensure that the right people have air weapons and that, therefore, the, the police can help to protect public safety through that way. Um, if it's £50, £60, £70 over five years, that's a relatively small price when compared to membership of a club or the amount that, that somebody will pay for some other interest, for example. Um, I accept what you say, that there's going to be a, a core of people who will just say, we'll hide our guns, we're not going to get involved in this, this licensing system. It's part and parcel of the implementation. We have to make sure that we're getting the message out and there's provision in the financial memorandum for a media campaign. And we have had the verbal agreement of the shooting organisations, for example, to help us get that message out. But we need to get it out to the wider community to make sure that people know there's a requirement in future to licence their guns. If people choose not to licence those weapons, um, then they are committing an offence, and uh, they will, the, the police will deal with that appropriately. And, and uh, as we go forward, it, it, it will, over time, help the police to identify air weapons that are in circulation with people who shouldn't have them. And, and there are provisions elsewhere in the bill which will then allow for the courts to order the forfeiture of those or, or well, to deal with them appropriately. If there's half a million weapons in circulation and you're talking about between 10 and 30,000 applications, I mean, to me, that means between 94 and 98 per cent of people are only going to bother getting them licensed. Uh, now, the uh, SARPA um, have basically said that a more realistic license number between 100 and 150,000 um, applications, even then, that would be a maximum of 30 per cent of people who appear to have these uh, weapons. So most people still. You know, blank the legislation, um, uh, but those who do apply, uh, but the cost of this will be millions of pounds. So, I mean, how is this actually going to actually deliver on what the bill is actually proposing in terms of improve, enhanced and improved safety? And we're talking about only small minorities of people actually, according to your own figures, um, going to actually get these guns licensed? Um, if, if I can say, I, I can't remember the, the, the paragraphs in the, the memorandum, but what we've, we've done is the 500,000 air weapons estimate is one that's generally accepted around the, the table of the working group that we've had as <clears throat> potentially the number of air weapons that have been out there um, and are potentially out there in Scotland. In actual fact, we expect a lot of them will simply be handed in because they're old, broken, unwanted. A lot of them will be sold on. Um, many people who own... Uh, guns of any sort, but air weapons in, uh, included, will have a number of different guns 
possibly because they've upgraded over the years, possibly because they do different types of shooting. Um, and by the time that we come down through these assumptions, um, it's how we get to actually, in, in the financial memorandum, potentially 40,000 existing firearm certificate holders will also have air weapons uh, certificates in future. Um, so the 20,000 estimate is brand new applicants to the system who have not got more powerful firearms, but who will come in and, and seek uh, a certificate for the air weapon or n multiple air weapons that they hold. It will be one certificate, and a person can hold one, two, or any number of air weapons on that certificate. Okay, I'm just going to ask one more kind of question in this area, because obviously there's other parts of the bill, and colleagues also want to uh, come in. Um, it, it, the, the FM states that the estimated maximum additional enforcement testing and reporting costs to be incurred by Police Scotland will amount to £90,000 per annum, which is an estimated 500 cases per year, £180 a case. Um, but, however, um, the, the, you know, the BSC questioned whether the figure implied the police expected to seize 500 weapons as a result of non-compliance and asked how this figure compared with an estimated 50 to 100 summary prosecutions quoted in the FM. So there appears to be a wee bit of a, an anomaly there. Um, again, what we're looking at is, is a difference between... Actually, it's, it's the line between the existing regime and, and, and the old regime. Uh, sorry, and the new regime. Um, the 500 tests that, that's in against Police Scotland costs um, is an estimate based on the number of actual weapons which might have to be tested, and they would be brand new tests. In, in fact, Police Scotland uh, may well be finding, and this is one of the, the benefits of, of the provisions in the bill, uh, may well be investigating um, other crimes, other complaints, and, and, and in the course of that, uh, find air weapons in a property or whatever. Um, now, in, in the current regime, they wouldn't be able to take them from from the point at which the, the bill provisions come into force. The police would be able to seize them and test them. Um, but as part and parcel, that would be as part and parcel of another investigation. So, for example, if they go into a property because of a domestic abuse complaint or for antisocial behaviour or whatever, there will already be a prosecution going on because of those other complaints. And then alongside that, if air weapons are seized, there will be tests. So the, the 500 tests are on potentially the number of, of air weapons which could be taken in those sort of investigations. But they may, may only go uh, become... 50 to 100 prosecutions, brand new prosecutions, simply for an air weapons licensing um, offence. Um, there are already, a, 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 in the existing firearms legislation as, as well, offences related to air weapons. So, for example, if somebody fires an air weapon beyond the boundaries of their own premises, or if somebody's uh, carrying an air weapon in the street, those are already offensives. So what we're looking at is... is in the licensing, there will be a number of new licensing-related offences that sit alongside ex existing investigations, insist existing prosecutions. Okay, and um, I did say that was the last one, but I do want to just mention one other thing. Appeals, how many appeals would you expect from people who have been refused licences, and what would be the cost of that? Appeals, um, I have to say, I looked at the written evidence, and we don't have uh, in the financial memorandum at the moment uh, a specific provision for appeals, and I apologise for that. Indeed, I know that. I will look at that again. I think on the basis of uh, criminal prosecutions, and we expect a relatively small number of brand new ones, um, at the time uh, the thinking was that will lead to a very low number of uh, potential criminal appeals. Um, the other discussion at the time, I, I understand the point that's being made by the British Association that there will be potentially a number of appeals against um, refusal of a certificate or against revocations. Um, I have to say in the existing firearms regime, the, the, the people who uh, apply uh, generally are, are people who are known in the system and are known to the police and are existing firearms owners. There's a very small number of refusals. I mean, around about 1% of applications are refused in each year uh, on the, the, the last statistics we have. And as our system rolls out, I think that will be uh, you know, something that we'll look to. The police will provide advice. It's very difficult to estimate the number of appeals at the moment, but... Um, it's something that uh, we will have to be aware of and perhaps revisit. Um, I'm also conscious, too, that there's, there's a whole new sheriff uh, appeals court system coming into play with the, the new legislation last year, so we have to look at how this will work, work through the system as well. So, um, difficult to say at the moment. I'm, clearly, ministers and, and, and officials are hoping that we're not 
looking at a lot of appeals. And because of a light touch system, we don't expect it to be a lot. OK, thank you. Uh, I'm just going to move on now to alcohol licensing. I'm going to spend less time in the next two sections, not least because I've taken 20 minutes. And as I said, I want colleagues to come in. But just um, in terms of uh, alcohol licensing, Western Martinshire Council and their evidence has said that uh, uh, the legislation sets a maximum fee which licensing boards can charge, but even though ours is charging the maximum fee, we incur an annual deficit of almost £89,000. And Glasgow uh, City Council said it should be noted that it's difficult, if not impossible, for bodies to print all these fees, taking into account the Scottish Government's proposals. And uh, South Lanarkshire says the Council doesn't currently have the funding in place to meet these. I mean, Surely this, all this, is, is go, this regime is going to add significant burdens to local authorities. The proposals within the bill are a broad mix, and they're really derived from suggestions that were floating about amongst stakeholders uh, and were, came, from, came from the consultation exercise. The idea was to finesse and improve the existing legislation, not to, you know, the idea is not to impose substantial additional burdens on local licensing boards. On that basis, on that, that basis we felt it was reasonable to say that the, we felt that the cost would be broadly neutral. In relation to the fees, we are there was detailed work carried out on reviewing the fees and although we would be sympathetic to the idea of amending the existing limits on the licensing fees, on having carried out the work we got very we got scant response from the local authorities and we really felt that we didn't at that time have enough information on which to base an uh, increase on the fees level. However, by creating by inserting a statutory duty on local authorities to, rec to report on their income and expenditure. That will give us a basis to understand all the local authorities, their costs and expenditure, and in time to raise fees if, if, if it is felt to be appropriate. Certainly one of the main findings coming out of the fees review was that the current occasional licence fee of £10 was felt to be insufficient, and certainly that is something that we feel that we could move on without extensive further work and it's something we'd be looking to move on fairly soon to improve to increase the occasional license fee okay uh, uh, thank you for that i mean cosla um, looking at the actual reports that are going to be produced have said that there are concerns that the introduction of a duty for boards to publish a financial report may be administratively difficult for local authorities depending on current accounting procedures cosla recognizes that this increases transparency and provide <coughs> evidence for any uh, future fee it increases, but uh, SEC go on uh, to add that uh, the, the, there's particular concerns uh, about the, the fee for occasional licences not being reviewed and that the current fee was already insufficient uh, to cover the cost of work involved in processing applications. Yes, the current fee is £10. It's set within secondary legislation, so that is something that we could increase out with the scope of this bill. Right. OK, uh, thank you for that. And just one final uh, uh, bit. Um, Kind of skimming, as I says, because I want to allow colleagues in. But uh, just to touch on civic licensing, um, um, the FM states the bill will give local authorities the power to refuse to grant private uh, hire car licences on the grounds of over provision. <laughs> uh, but the Scottish Taxi Federation has said that the financial memorandum had, and I quote, got things badly wrong and questioned how the financial memorandum's estimate had been reached, stating that no suitable methodology or measuring tool existed at present. Uh, and indeed, they go on to say it would be difficult, if not impossible, to survive such a tool. So I'm just wondering um, how you actually have reached these kind of estimates. There is, at, at, mo at the moment, there is no equivalent test within private hire cars. There is a sort of similar test in relation to taxis, which relates to unmet demand, but that is a different test. We took the figure from Napier University that quoted, I think it was 15,000 15 to 20,000 or something, it's in the financial memo, that quoted uh, an indicative level for the unmet demand test uh, and quoted that as an example. In practice, it's a completely new test. We don't know how, we haven't devised a procedure yet for what would be appropriate for it. I think the point raised by Scottish Taxi Federation and others that that figure of around 15,000 might be on the low side is possibly the case for a large authority like Edinburgh or Glasgow. However, those are quite exceptional. A lot of local licensing authorities have very small numbers of private hires and were, to, were they to carry out an unmet demand test, then the figure would probably be a lot lower. We'd certainly be happy to work with local, local licensing authorities and relevant stakeholders 
to work together in developing an appropriate methodology for testing this. Okay, thank you. I did say I was going to open up the session, but none of my colleagues have indicated that they want to ask any questions as yet. I hope that they will. So I'll ask you one where they all get themselves psyched up for that, um, which is with regard to um, the fact that uh, the FM notes that some local authorities might receive no fee income from sexual entertainment venues, for example, where none exists in a local authority area, but they could incur tens of thousands of pounds in legal fees should an operator challenge a decision not to grant a licence. <clears throat> yeah, we do recognise the risk within the financial memorandum, but um, the, the precise costs of how much challenge could cost are very hard to pin down. Um, in, in respect of a low-level um, challenge on a civic licence, for example, a private hire car driver licence going to the Sheriff Court, uh, Glasgow Council estimated that between two and a half and three thousand pounds. If something goes all the way to the inner house of the court of session, then the, course, the costs are very substantial, and there's no getting away from that. Although hard to be precise, um, within the 1982 Act, there was um, a responsibility for local authorities to ensure that the cost of licensing, in totality, does um, um, is covered by the licensing fees. But ultimately on a very expensive case, it's for the local authorities to take a judgment whether they think it's worth pursuing and whether the public benefit that, is, um, that they're trying to achieve would warrant pursuing all the way through the courts um, and to incur that expenditure. OK, uh, thank you for that. Uh, my colleagues now do uh, wish to ask questions. The first one will be Mark to be followed by Richard. Th thank you, Convener. Um, a, a number of points during the... Uh, financial memorandum, uh, various um, organisations have highlighted concerns around costs of appeals. Um, it, it occurs from the, the British Association of Shooting and Conservation in relation to air rifles, from the Scottish Taxi Federation in relation to taxis, uh, and from various licensing boards in relation to some of the new changes, particularly around fit and proper person. Um, and there are concerns that cost of appeals ha have not been properly factored in, uh, in in these areas. I wonder if you'd like to respond to that. Sorry. Well, if I can, um, I mean, that, that, that's a question that covers, of course, all the licensing regimes, um, so I, I will deal with it in an appropriately um, broad fashion, if I may. Um, if we are talking about appeals in respect of decisions taken by either the local authorities um, or indeed the police um, in respect of whether or not to grant an application or whether to revoke an application, um, it strikes me that it's right that, well, I should probably say, the way to eliminate the possibility of, a, of an appeal would be to have no appeal system, but I don't think anyone's suggesting that. So the moment we do have an appeal system, of course, the possibility of appeal arises. The likelihood of an appeal um, largely will depend on the quality of the decision taken. Um, amongst other things. Um, it also depends, of course, um, on the mindset um, and the positioning of the, of, of the potential appellant. So it's one of the situations where, where, yes, the moment we have an appeal system in place, and we do for all of the licensing decisions, um, the possibility of an appeal exists. The, however, the likelihood of that appeal um, is a different factor, and it's, it's, it's a factor that has, it's a decision. Um, it's something that it can only really be, be ascertained on a case-by-case -case basis um, as to how likely that is um, and, and, and what indeed the costs of that will be. I don't know if any of my colleagues want to say anything about the specific regimes. But. Just to add to the point that Mr Gibson made, um, there are, of course, only about 17 to 20 sexual entertainment venues within Scotland, so that of itself limits the scope for appeals that, um, that could be taken through the courts. Well, 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 you say that um, in relation to sexual entertainment venues, but of course, in the <clears throat> in the responses that we've received, uh, the point is raised that obviously there may be um, appeals against refusals. Um, so, obviously, um, while there are a small number in existence, there will, of course, be potential applications which, prior to the legislation, would have gone through the alcohol licensing or, or uh, other route. Um, but this creation of a new uh, licensing regime um, would potentially lead to uh, refusals under that regime and thus appeals to those refusals. So while I think basing it on a small number in existence perhaps doesn't reflect what may happen and I think that's the point that licensing boards are attempting to get across and I realise you know, that the 
it's difficult to put an exact figure on it, but of course the point of a financial memorandum is it is supposed to deal also in best estimates. So when looking at this, did you look at um, the, the scenario around applications that were refused rather than simply those that are already in existence? Yeah. Well, you're perfectly correct. There would be applications on top of that, but the point is still that um, lap dancing clubs have been in existence in Scotland for perhaps 15 years and still after that period we've only reached the point of about 20 so there is, it is reasonable to infer that the demand is limited so there will be applications but it's not going to be an enormous number um, and in terms of the costs of appeals again, it just depends how far they are prosecuted through the courts going to the inner house of the court of session will be expensive um, but we've never had a better estimate of how much it would exactly cost than the figure of tens of thousands. Okay. There's a feeling uh, in relation to the um, introduction of the, the fit and proper person criteria in relation to personal licences that the definition is uh, vague and could lead to um, a number of challenges on the back of it. Um, the Glasgow City Council Licensing Board, for example, say the current drafting of the bill creates uncertainty as to the scope of the test and, unless corrected, will expose boards to increased litigation costs until case law provides necessary judicial clarity. Is this something that you have um, had raised with you directly around the fit and proper person test and is it something that the government intends to look at as it moves forward with the legislation? and proper test was, has been very carefully drafted. There are existing fit and proper tests in other pieces of legislation that the local authorities will be quite familiar with. So it is not a completely new concept. It has also been framed in that it has reference to the overarching licensing objectives for the, the Licensing Scotland Act. Those are broadly, broadly framed and ensure that the local authorities they provide certain constraints on the decision that the local authority can make, but where, where the local authorities to ignore those constraints, they would still be ground by they would still be bound by the overall scope of the bill, you know, the, the bright true decision that has been refer that is frequently referenced, uh, related to a board making decisions out that beyond really the scope of the bill, and you know by reference by referencing the fit and proper test to the overarching licensing objectives it ensures that the, you know, that the decisions made by the board are constrained within the purpose of the scope of the bill, mm. well, the scope of the Act, sorry. Okay. Um, and just finally on the issue around um, public entertainment venues, the, uh, the financial memorandum states that the uh, abolition of theatre licences would... Uh, represent a decrease in regulatory burden overall, but evidence to the committee from Dumfries and Galloway Council um, says those authorities not currently licensing places of public entertainment would need to undertake a substantial and detailed process to assess whether there is a need to license theatres as places of public entertainment uh, and further states that those that already do would incur significant press publication fees for statutory notices if the authority's resolution is to be widened to include theatres. And Glasgow City Council um, has urged the government to introduce provisions to allow the necessary amendment to the resolution to be expedited, which it has suggested would reduce the costs to theatre owners, etc. Um, so on the one hand, we're being told there's a reduction in the burden. On the other hand, we're being given evidence that would suggest that there will be an increase in terms of the costs in some places. I um, wonder if somebody could perhaps reconcile that. Uh, I think the point about decreased regulatory burden was actually upon the theatres themselves, um, some of whom may have to have a theatre licence and a public entertainment licence at the moment, whereas this would be a more streamlined system um, that would allow uh, a theatre, for example, just to apply for the one licence. Um, in the longer term, we'd also expect having to operate a single regime rather than two would have benefits for local authorities. Um, in terms of the expediting the nine-month period between a local authority passing a resolution and actually coming into force, I think it's reasonable that there has to be some period between an authority announcing that something needs to be licensed and actually coming into force so people have got time to apply for licences and to get ready for it. The current period is nine months, which we're not especially wedded to, but it's hard to see how it could be less than a matter of several months. 
Um, but it should also be pointed out that public entertainment licence is very wide, it's very flexible, so the local authority could decide to licence, and many of them do billiard halls, for example, or snooker clubs. Um, and from the point of making that decision to actually coming into force, you do need a period of months. Uh, the requirements of the 1982 Act are that an authority publish the resolution, invite comments, and then consider those representations. But there is a degree of work, obviously, to reach the point at which a draft resolution can be published, but that amount of work should be proportionate to um, what it's been proposed to do. Um, in this case, would expect there be a strong assumption that theatres should fall under public entertainment licensing. They are already licensed, and they have largely the same characteristics as many of the other forms of entertainment which are licensed as public entertainment. In these circumstances, we wouldn't expect a substantial and um, detailed process to actually be required. And finally, on the fees, um, yeah, we do recognise that publishing the sort of uh, classified advert that is required under the Act just to notify people of uh, a change in resolution has a cost. Uh, Glasgow estimated that uh, cost of an advert would range from 300 to 550 pounds, uh, the last two having been 340 and 522. So it is, it is a cost of a few hundred pounds, um, but it's not an ongoing cost. I think it would probably have to be incurred twice um, during the process of changing a public entertainment resolution. I was just going to ask on that. I mean, I'm, I'm by no means an expert, so this is very much the daft laddie question, but uh, presumably these adverts do not need to be for each individual licence and can be applied collectively. Um, so, for example, if a number of venues uh, are um, going through this licensing process, they can all be captured within the one advert uh, advertisement, which obviously reduces the cost burden. Yeah, I mean, the cost that's actually being referred to here is that when a local authority determines to change their public entertainment resolution, i.e. saying what it is we're going to licence, they have to advertise that fact. Um, and invite comments, and then they have to put another advert in at the end of that process saying this is what the final resolution looks like. So it's not about individual applications, it's about the totality of what's changing within a local authority area. Okay, thank you. I thank you, I wanted to return to the submission from the Scottish Taxi Federation. Um, now, um, they say <coughs> this will impact on their members because of the government's comments that additional costs should be charged to licence fees. Um, now, in, in paragraph 170, uh, you've given an indicative value of the cost to um, uh, drivers' vehicles and booking offices from the, uh, uh, with examples of fees set out in five licensing uh, authorities. Um, do those examples you've given include um, the addition, any additional costs you expect to see from the implementation of this, of this legislation? Or do the comments from the Taxi Federation reflect the fact that they think that uh, these costs will go, are likely to increase in the future um, because of um, additional costs that could be through uh, appeals and, uh, and uh, other impacts of legislation? The financial statement includes uh, re reports, actual licence fees that were being charged at the time, at the time we asked. The time, rather Those than, are existing ones. And what assessment yeah. have, you, have you made then of what impact this legislation might have in terms of additional um, uh, increased costs for, for licence fees for, for taxi drivers and, and it's others? It's very difficult to gauge because an awful lot... Uh, uh, the, sorry, the, over, the over provision in relation to pr private hire is a discretionary part. It's up to local authorities whether they wish to introduce it. Although when we consulted, there did seem to be broad support for it. Certainly, in the call for evidence, there doesn't seem to be any. There doesn't seem to be a lot of indication that local authorities are keen to use this, use this additional power. If, if local authorities decide not to use it, there will be no additional cost. Okay. And finally, then, in terms of that um, additional cost, if if it is the fact that an, an authority applies that power. Um, the, the Taxi Federation wish to be clear whether the cost of the administering the other provision section and the possible court challenges will only be charged back to the licensees for private hire car operators or is that to the regime in general? I, I have had a look at the legislation. I can't, I, I'm not a lawyer, so I can't really offer a legal view. It, see, it doesn't seem to me to be prescriptive as to how the local authority would allocate that, as to whether it was within just the private hire element or within the, the taxi element. At the moment, there is an unmet demand test in relation to taxis. I, I'm not sure whether local authorities restrict the cost of that to the existing taxis or whether they 
they spread that across the private hire, I suspect it's really an issue for the local authority to decide on for themselves. Thank you very Thank you very much. Uh, there appear to be no further questions from committee. I'm just wondering if there's any further points that you would like to put to committee before we wind up the session. No, thank, you. thank you very much um, for hearing our evidence today. Um, if there's anything um, further that we can help you with, um, please let us know and we'd, we'd happily provide further comment. Okay, thank you uh, very much for that. That being the end of the public part of today's deliberations, I'm going to call... call uh, I'm going to call a small uh, recess. Before I do, I just want to get the um, agreement of committee that we will look at this report in private at the next session. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you. Both.